Over the past few years, there's been a radical shift in the way that people talk about sex and gender in America. All of a sudden, it seems like nobody can agree on basic questions like, what is a woman? What's the difference between sex and gender? And are these categories even real or meaningful? Transgender activists are pushing for greater levels of acceptance and inclusion, while likening those who disagree to transphobic bigots. At the same time, many feminists worry about what they see as the erasure of women's role in society, the unfair competition against trans women in sports, and their daughters feeling unsafe in school bathrooms. It's one thing for adults to live and present themselves as they choose, but when children, legally unable to consent, start being chemically and surgically altered, sometimes permanently, the issue becomes more complicated. And it's not surprising that many parents are concerned. Last year, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health removed all age restrictions for hormone therapy and surgery. Puberty blockers are sometimes prescribed to delay the development of secondary sex characteristics until more drastic measures can be taken. Across the states, a legal battle has been waged over this issue, with states like Florida attempting to ban those procedures from minors, while California wants to prevent parents from stopping or even knowing about the treatment their children are undergoing. Are we helping children to affirm who they really are inside? Or are we indoctrinating them into a cult of gender ideology that could leave them scarred literally and figuratively for life? Where did gender ideology come from? And how has it seemingly taken over our schools, captured our medical institutions, and co-opted government policy? I spoke to Lior Sapir, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute who wrote his PhD on how government regulations have affected the introduction and prevalence of gender ideology into schools. Critical theory has been, I would say, the dominant intellectual paradigm in schools of education um, for several decades now, um, sp uh, especially on the racial issue. But once once they adopted it on the racial issue, the doors were open for the gender issue as well. Um, so, you know, the schools of education are the gatekeepers for belonging to the teaching profession, certainly in the public schools. And so, uh, you know, any teacher who goes, who wants to become accredited and teach long term in public schools has to go through these kind of centers of critical theory and indoctrination. And I, I, I'm i saying that uh, sincerely, they are centers for critical theory and indoctrination. That indoctrination is not always successful, but in many cases it is. As an outgrowth of critical theory, gender ideology attempts to view the world through the lens of sex and gender. And as a facet of postmodernism, it seeks to replace any concept of objective truth with the subjective feelings of the individual. Gender ideology really encompasses two distinct and incompatible philosophical positions, or I should say orientations. Um, one is queer theory, uh, but the other is what I would call gender identity essentialism. Um, and queer theory states that not just gender, but sex itself is a social construct. Right. So the kind of the feminist distinction between sex and gender, which was meant to call attention to the socially constructed aspects of, of human sex differences and to show that, you know, assumptions about what's, so to speak, natural to women and natural to men is really just um, social attitudes. Um, uh, queer theory takes issue with feminism of that sort. Queer theory says, no, it's all gender. There's no such thing as sex. Even the body itself is socially constructed, which is a very kind of bizarre proposition. Uh, I won't get into that right now, but uh, it, it's enough to just point out that queer theory dissolves the idea of biological sex, of objective reality into social constructivism. When you hear the claim, for example, that sex is a spectrum, or you hear claims about sex being, quote, assigned at birth, these types of claims come directly out of queer theory. Biological sex is fake. Yes, we all know that gender roles are fake, but do not say to a trans person, biologically male, born female, male-bodied. No, 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 no. There is no biological criteria for gender that is both universal and a binary in human beings. Where does that leave us? Free. Queer theory posits that gender is not who you are, but a performance. Meaning that in order to be a woman, all you have to do is act like a woman. And yet queer theory also maintains that strict gender roles are based on an oppressive system of social regulation. One of the goals of queer theory is to perform a non-binary identity, which is to intentionally blur or obfuscate gender categories. This is the true goal of gender theory nonconformity. 
so to put this another way, the kind of transgender, uh, let's call it transgenderism, that we see nowadays in mainstream discourses, right? The kind of the Caitlyn Jenner, the Laverne Cox, the Jazz Jennings, um, uh, all these people who who uh, want to appear to be exactly like the most typical members of the opposite sex, according to queer theory, these are not nonconformists. On the contrary, um, they are absolutely conforming. And they're, in fact, you could, I think, make the argument that the, they're, they're conforming even more so than people like you or me, for whom, you know, gender is kind of a more spontaneous and unthinking performance. Um, because if you do the performance deliberately and you take on all the most stereotypical trappings of the opposite sex, then you're performing gender consciously um, in a way that's normative and scripted. The, the other position that marches under this umbrella term gender ideology is what I've been calling gender identity essentialism. And this is almost the polar opposite, right? It agrees with queer theory in the sense that it disregards the body as having any relevance for our status as sexed or gendered beings. But that's but even that turns out to be not exactly true because the claim made in this particular philosophical orientation is that gender identity uh, is, is, is rooted somehow in the deep self, um, the natural self, not the socially constructed self, right? The self that exists prior to, to socialization, prior to cultural imposition. Um, and I think if, if you really go to kind of policymakers, the medical establishment, mainstream cultural institutions, you're likely to see, you're, you're a lot more likely to see the claim that gender identity is brain sex. I mean, they'll, they say this explicitly, it's rooted in the brain, right? In other words, one is born with the brain of the other sex. And, and from this, you know, a, a set of assumptions, it's not hard to see why this would authorize medical transition of minors. Because if you're born with a female brain and a male body or vice versa, and there's nothing you can do to change that, and it would be agonizing for you to have to live, uh, to be forced to live according to the sex that's not your brain, um, and there is a technology that's relatively safe uh, for you to, to make your body conform to the brain, why not do it? In fact, it would be cruel not to do it. Queer theory and gender identity essentialism make two opposing claims, that sex is a social construct and that trans people are innately born members of the opposite sex. These can't both be true, but they are both used simultaneously by trans activists to argue that transitioning is good and healthy for young people, and that gender ideology should be taught in schools. There's a lot of other subtle mechanisms by which these ideas have entered into public schools. So let me give you one example, um, and this was kind of what, uh, you know, what I focused on in my own doctoral work, um, and that is the use of Title IX, the 1972 federal law that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. Um, the Obama administration, through a series, uh, a complicated, convoluted series of um, administrative guidelines, investigations, and court agency interactions, expanded Title IX um, to say, uh, as a condition of receiving federal funds, schools have to treat students who reject their sex in favor of some other uh, gender um, the schools have to treat these students according to their gender in those areas of school life where sex separation is still legitimate. So restrooms, locker rooms, sports teams, sex ed, um, you know, classes, things like that. Um, now, it's not as though the Obama administration got together and kind of deliberately and consciously launched this policy. Um, Rather, what happened is that through a very complicated series of, um, of uh, investigations by the Federal Office for Civil Rights under the Department of Education, um, schools were, were gently but, but, uh, but consistently prodded to move into this direction. So when a school implements these seemingly neutral and good intended policies, whose purpose is to promote inclusion, understanding, respect, um, for example, by teaching about transgender issues, by teaching about gender identity, putting up posters of being an ally to trans people and this, that, and the other. Um, so Nash, just like me, is non-binary. So they aren't sure if they're a boy or a girl. They think that they're just merely providing emotional support or an inclusive environment. What they don't understand is that they are, number one, causing identity dislocation and disassociation, meaning 
They're taking kids for whom being a boy or a girl would otherwise just be at the background of their consciousness. It would not, they wouldn't even be thinking about it. Um, but now all of a sudden it becomes a question. Do I accept my assigned sex at birth? Um, does it feel right to me? It becomes a problem and a problem that you can solve through an act of will. You can declare yourself, assert yourself to be something else. In the past decade, the number of trans identifying kids has risen 30 to 40 fold by some estimates. The UK's Tavistock Clinic recorded a rise of 3,360% in number of patients between 2009 and 2018. A recent Reuters investigation found that gender dysphoria diagnoses rose 20% annually between 2017 and 2020, and then 80% between 2020 and 2021. This extremely rapid increase in trans-identifying youth has led many to wonder whether the phenomenon is real, or whether it's a sort of social contagion driven by pressure both from peers, social media, and authority figures. We know based on data reported by gender clinics around the world that an extremely high percentage of kids who are referred to pediatric gender clinics um, are on the autism spectrum. I think the most plausible explanation is that, you know, if, if, if you tell a kid, look, you're, you're all these problems that you're having, fitting in, adjusting, making sense of complicated social interactions are because of a condition that you have that you're going to have for the rest of your life and you have to deal with. That's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but if you come in and say, look, uh, all these problems of social maladjustment and feeling that you don't fit in are because you were assigned the wrong sex at birth. And you know what? We have a solution for you. If you transition, um, all of these feelings of distress, anxiety, and lack of social adjustment will go away. Um, that's extremely appealing to an autistic kid, and you can understand why. They, they do what's known as facilitating social transition. And that refers to when a, a, a child wants to use a new name, new pronouns, use the bathrooms and sports teams that are designated for the other sex. Uh, in effect, to transition socially, not yet medically. And again, here, you know, teachers and I think many parents think that this is just an innocent act of showing respect and, and being inclusive. What they don't understand is that 12 studies done to this day, the combination of those 12 studies show that if you socially transition kids before puberty, they are far, far more likely to persist in their dysphoria, to develop these dysphoric feelings and to persist in that dysphoria into puberty and then go on medication. Whereas if you just leave them alone, you just treat their, their cross-gender feelings and behaviors as innocent and, and uh, you know, temporary, uh, to innocent and temporary phase of, of uh, identity consolidation, um, the vast majority of those kids, studies have shown, will desist, meaning they'll come to terms with their bodies, with their biological sex, and in fact, most of them will later come out as gay or lesbian. You might ask, how can doctors recommend such drastic procedures with very little long-term data? The answer is that doctors, psychiatrists, and therapists make treatment protocols based on treatment standards put forth by their governing medical organizations. And unfortunately, these medical organizations have been rapidly and systematically captured by the same gender ideology activists sourcing their ideas from queer theory and gender identity essentialism. The AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, in 2016, a, a group of six uh, pediatricians got together. They basically formed the backbone of, of a new working group called LGBT Health and Wellness. Four of them were kind of strong, you know, pro-gender uh, transition activists. They had already been engaged in transitioning kids and things like that. Um, and uh, two years later, one of these doctors, Jason Rafferty, um, writes a, a position paper on behalf of the AAP that's published in the AAP's major uh, publication, Pediatrics. Um, which, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental argument of this uh, 2018 paper is that the approach known as watchful waiting, which is when clinicians treat prepubertal children with cross-gender feelings and behaviors and basically say, let's just wait it out. We're not going to transition them. We're not going to affirm them as really being the opposite sex because the vast majority of them will come to terms with reality. Rafferty says, no, no, this practice has no evidence. It's been thoroughly discredited. And in fact, he calls it conversion therapy, right? Which is that term that's reserved for efforts to get gay people to, to make gay people straight. And what's interesting is that in a subsequent fact check of the Rafferty 2018 paper, it found that 
Uh, not only did he omit any mention of all the studies that show that the vast majority of these kids will desist by puberty, um, but that the studies that he cited in support of his claim that, um, that failure to affirm these kids is conversion therapy actually said the exact opposite. These studies explicitly said watchful waiting is the only uh, scientifically supported treatment protocol for these kids. So it was a paper that was just completely distorted all available evidence. You'd be surprised to learn that this is still the position paper that informs the basis of the AAP's entire position on pediatric gender medicine. They have never, not only have they not renounced the paper, they have not even been willing to subject it to criticism. You know, Sweden, Finland, and, uh, and the UK have done these systematic reviews, and all three of them have come to the same conclusion that there's no evidence that the benefits of uh, a gender transition, medical gender transition outweigh the risks. Um, Florida recently commissioned an overview of systematic reviews of evidence and came to the exact same conclusion. Um, so we have the American medical establishment is basing its recommendations on a highly dubious cherry picked study by, uh, by a doctor who, uh, whose paper never went through peer review and, um, and, and that has stifled dissent and debate ever since. Um, and, you know, tens of thousands of kids are being subjected to these treatments on that basis. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when remote schooling became the norm, many parents were horrified to discover for the first time what their children were actually being taught. Now that in-person classes have resumed across the country, it's natural for parents to be concerned about what their kids are being exposed to without their knowledge. The Biden administration is quietly trying to reinterpret Title IX to pressure schools to not inform and involve parents in decisions to socially transition their kids. Um, so first of all, if the parents are seeing it happen, they're already, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to say ahead of the curve, but, but they're already in a, in a relatively good position. Um, what can they do? Um, first of all, gather data and evidence. That's really important. Everything sh you should have as much evidence as possible because you better believe that you're going to end up taking legal action at some point. If this goes south, um, you're going to take legal action. Um, number two, get in touch with a lawyer immediately because there are there, there's good law, federal law, that requires uh, uh, schools to sh disclose this kind of information to parents and that sets up parents as the decision makers for uh, health care and mental health care related decisions of their kids. Teachers and administrators and activists, LGBT activist groups, um, cannot usurp that authority, that prerogative from parents. With attitudes around gender changing so rapidly, one can't help but wonder what the future holds. Is gender ideology the new normal? And are dissenters, as critics claim, just stuck in the past, refusing to adapt? Or will we look back on this period as an aberration, a momentary hiccup in the age-old acceptance that sex is, in fact, real? I think what we'll see is a gradual walking back, walking away from saying, no, no, we never really meant it this way. We never really meant it that way. You misunderstood us. You know, that's going to be, that. that's how this is going to die out. And it will die out eventually. It's just a matter of time. 